You can have a seat. It's interesting on this Thanksgiving Day, singing about Thanksgiving and just picturing that echo holy experience, right? Uh, picturing that holy is the Lord moment as uh, a million angels fall face down on the floor. Uh, sometimes when we picture heaven, we try to wonder exactly what heaven might be like. Uh, sometimes, thanks to Philadelphia cream cheese, we kind of get this idea that, you know, maybe it's going to be kind of clouds and harps and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but I think that song expresses in a great way the reverence of what heaven's going to be like. But on this day, this Thanksgiving day, this is actually a picture of heaven as well. Because a big part of what heaven is going to be like is it's going to be giving thanks and telling the God stories and giving celebration to Jesus for all that he's done. Uh, in Ephesians 2, uh, a fantastic passage, 1 to uh, 10, it kind of talks about who we once were, but how Jesus saved us. Uh, and in verse 7, uh, it talks about how because uh, God's so rich in mercy, he loved us so much, uh, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Uh, he raised us up from the dead along with Christ. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Jesus Christ. And verse 7 says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown uh, in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Friends, your life is a trophy of God's grace and part of heaven uh, will be thanksgiving moments of just celebrating this is what Jesus has done for me. This is how he transformed me. Uh, this is how he rescued and redeemed me. And sometimes I imagine, you know, as each person stands up to give testimony, the roar of heaven uh, celebrating Jesus as we see the work that he's done in uh, different people's lives. So happy Thanksgiving again. Uh, we're very excited uh, that you're joining us. Uh, and as we continue in, uh, in our service, we're going to get into our message time now. Uh, and today we're going to continue to talk about the idea of foundations. Last week, as we began this sermon series, we talked about what it means to be a disciple. Uh, a disciple is one who has said yes to the invitation of Jesus. Uh, they are growing in identity with Jesus, and they're walking in obedience to Jesus. And as part of that sermon, I talked about God's goal for your life. Uh, his plan for your discipleship journey, uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18, uh, Paul says, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and whatever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who've had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we're changed into His glorious image. Friends, that's the plan of God for your life. He wants to make you look more and more and more like Jesus, and he wants to do that by bringing more and more freedom into your life, by breaking the chains uh, that sin and Satan and death have on your life. He wants to break those chains and bring you freedom. He wants to remove the veil uh, that's blinded you to the truth of God, and he wants to make you look like Jesus. And so if you've accepted the invitation of following Jesus, if you've placed your faith and trust in him, his desire is nothing less than you would become more and more like Jesus, walking in greater freedom and obedience. And so to be a disciple is to be on a journey of becoming like Jesus, growing in wholeness and holiness. In your journey to become holy, have you ever felt stuck? Because I can tell you that I have felt stuck. Like I am not seeing the victory that's promised me in the Bible, in God's word. Like I... I'm not able to walk in the freedom because I just keep doing the same things over and over again and feeling the same things over and over again. It seems like there's just sin patterns that seem impossible to break or joy that feels like it's never going to come. There's this great passage in Romans 7, and Paul describes this exact problem. And I think we're all pretty familiar with this passage, even if we don't know exactly where it is. Um, but we're familiar with it because it resonates with our hearts. It says in Romans chapter 7, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is right, but I do it anyways. Or sorry, I don't want to do what is wrong, and I do it anyways. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. 
I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? We can relate to that at least at some point in our life, right? What? I want to do what's right, but I can't seem to get there. I, I always respond this way or I always respond that way. That's not the way Jesus would want me to respond. And we go in these cycles and we end up feeling like miserable people. And that is never, ever what God intended for us. We ask the question, who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Will I ever be able to find the victory that's promised? One of the biggest lies that the enemy whispers to you is an answer to that question. And he says, no, you'll never find freedom. You will always be stuck like this on this earth. Maybe one day in heaven you will be free of it. But on earth, you're always stuck in this pit. Let me tell you, friends, that actually is a lie from the enemy because we stop here in Romans 7 where it says, who will free me? But Paul keeps going, you guys. That's the good news. Paul keeps Mm -hmm. going. And so even though we read the passage and we read through the whole thing, in our hearts we get stuck at the first point where Jesus is saying, actually, I want you to get stuck on the second point. And this is what he says. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. So often we feel stuck. Our brain says that freedom from the power of sin is possible but if we're really honest we're not sure it's true when we look at our circumstances fear anxiety anger selfishness powerlessness they seem to be what's in front of us and we just feel stuck it's interesting as jen was sort of saying that with that whole idea of satan's lies one of the ways that instead of him saying no uh, one of the ways that he is twisting it now is is that's just who i am I'm always going to react in anger first because that's just who I am. That's the way that God made me. I'm just always going to bend the truth a little bit because that's just who I am. And Paul is actually saying, well, that may be who you were, but there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law that that leads to sin and death. And so there is a new reality, friends. Uh, But so often as we're trying to grow, as we're trying to move forward, it can feel like we get stuck. And the thing is, when it feels like we're stuck, it's usually because we're stuck. We're stuck somewhere in our spiritual journey. We've stopped growing. We've stopped flourishing. And as we go through this series, we'll continually be coming back to two images as we talk about getting unstuck. Uh, We're going to talk about how our soul is like a house, and we're going to talk about how our soul is like a suitcase. Uh, And I do have to let you know that you will find yourself stuck in the strangest places. Uh, I feel like I was stuck the longest and the deepest in my spiritual life, my second and third years of Bible college. Training for ministry, surrounded by godly mentors and people, That was where I felt the most stuck in my spiritual life because the Bible became a textbook to study. It wasn't God's word anymore. It was, oh, okay, what is this theory about this passage? What is this? Uh, And so, friends, I just want to let you know that if you feel stuck, it's okay. All of us get stuck. I have been stuck. I find myself stuck many times. And so we want to explore this idea of being stuck and getting unstuck. Uh, We're going to use a couple different pictures. Uh, The picture that I am going to keep coming back to, uh, one way to view the discipleship journey is to picture an HGTV home rehab. Uh, How many of you have watched HGTV? Do you have any people who've watched some of those shows? They they find this derelict house. It's broken down. There's mold. Uh, Sometimes there are unflushed toilets that have been moldering and festering for years and those are the ones that they always put on those shows because they just want to show you the nastiest filth and as they go through the 45 minute experience that home goes from disaster to work of beauty that has one of the highest values in the neighborhood and as I picture my own spiritual journey there are times where I realize that the home of my soul 
Uh, it's like a run-down house. It's been decorated with whatever trends that I've got excited about in culture. Uh, I've had people in my home who've wrecked things or who've tried to decorate it to its own standards. Uh, I have filled my soul with stuff. And so the home of my heart, it's been exposed to all kinds of st- to trouble, uh, floods and winds and storms. And so uh, in many ways, as I picture the home of my heart, as I picture my soul, I realize that there is stuff that has accumulated. There is things that have broken down. There is junk that has accumulated, and, and there's places that are wrecked. And in any of those HGTV transformation journeys, as a home begins to be transformed, uh, the thing is, what really matters is what's unseen behind the walls, the electrical, the plumbing, the foundation, the beams. I mean, they always come in and they get rid of stuff. They always come in and throw things away. They rip down curtains. They want to put up new paint, but, but they never start with the exterior. They never start with the paint. They always take a look deeper. They always look at the foundation. They always look at the wiring because that's where the real trouble is. If you just put a coat of paint over something that's cracked, in, in a couple of years, the cracks are going to show through again. And so for true transformation to occur, You have to look deeper. You have to look at the foundation. You have to address the structural defects. You have to deal with leaks. You have to repair electrical and plumbing. And so for a house to be strong, you have to look at the foundation. And as we seek to be transformed by Jesus, as we seek to get unstuck, uh, the journey is to invite him into those rooms of our life to deal with the mess, uh, to deal with the junk. We're going to be inviting him into those rooms in our house that other people have wrecked, uh, where we need him to help us fix the drywall and, and, and clean the carpets and put in new flooring. Uh, but we also are going to invite him to go deep to the foundation and ensure that our lives are being built solidly on him. Because where the foundation of your life is shaky, Uh, Where your house is leaking, in those places there is sickness, there is shakiness. Where the problems are unnoticed or unaddressed, those are the places where we will remain stuck. Another analogy that's been super helpful to me is the analogy of the suitcase. Um, There's one analogy out there that we carry baggage around with us, so lots of different suitcases. This one is slightly different than that. This one talks about how our souls, our lives, they're like a suitcase. Um, And I get this analogy from Dr. Reamer, who uses it in his book, Soul Care. Um, So if we think of our lives and souls as a suitcase, as we go through life, we pick things up. It's just natural. There's good things, there's good memories, good lessons, good encounters, good relationships, and so on. And then there's junk that collects. Basically because we live in a fallen world and there's sin all around us. And so the things that we can collect are lies about who we are, traumatic memories, rage, bitterness, unforgiveness, sin patterns formed over a lifetime, fears, wrong views of God, unrepentant sin, and the list goes on. And so these things start to pile up in the suitcase of our souls. So what happens is when we choose to follow Jesus, when we say yes to him, the Bible promises that the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. That is the good news. If we go back to Romans 7, we read there, we look and keep reading into chapter 8, we see that by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are given the power to overcome sin in our lives. Like I said before, sometimes it's easier to resonate with the problem than the solution. But Paul does give us the solution. It's the Holy Spirit in our lives. So how does this suitcase metaphor help? Well, we have the suitcase of our souls. It's filled with junk over a lifetime of just living in a sinful, fallen world. And the Holy Spirit, when we say yes to Jesus, he comes and he fills us. But he can only come fill the places where there's room for him to fill. And so he'll come in and he'll go into every single crack and crevice and space that there is in our souls. But if there is junk in the way, he can't fill those spaces. So he comes to us and he wants to help us in our journey to become more like Jesus, to take the junk out of the suitcase of our souls and to fill it with more of him. Sorry, I'm always a mom, so I just 
noticing when things aren't quite white, right, in my mom world, and I got distracted. All right. Um, so Jesus wants us to help deal, sorry, Jesus wants to help us deal with all the junk, the negative things that are weighing us down. Uh, Hebrews talks about stripping off everything, all the sin that weighs us down, and this is just, this is just a part of that. Um, junk in our souls is a natural consequence to sin, and thankfully there's provision for freedom in the cross. As we unpack the suitcases of our souls, the Holy Spirit can fill us more and more and more, which means more power to overcome. It's kind of like a divine snowball, and it's a beautiful thing. I think we see this imagery a lot all over the New Testament of taking things off or pulling things out and then putting things on. And I just want to take a bit of a closer look at one of those passages. So Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. So this is Ephesians 4. It says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. The passage then goes on to give specifics about what to throw off and what to put on. But what I love about the beginning here where I read is that it reminds us that this is all done by the power of the Holy Spirit through his renewal in our lives. We can't make it happen. The junk, some of it, maybe by sheer willpower, we could make it go away, but the root of the junk would still be there. We need the Holy Spirit's help. We need him and him alone to help us move forward in freedom. So the Holy Spirit, he knows what's in the way. He knows what's there, and he knows what's stopping his movement. So he helps us by pointing it out and then helping us remove it. But there's a process of taking off and putting on that's very clear. Without unpacking the suitcase, without taking off the junk, we can't put on the things of God. We can't walk in power, authority, and freedom that we were always designed to walk in. And so we need to go through this process of letting the Holy Spirit unpack our suitcase. Yeah, it, uh, it is definitely one of those images that really grips your heart. Even as Jen was talking about it, I realized, man, if I come home from a trip and my suitcase is full of dirty laundry, I mean, used underwear, used socks, the uh, swimming uh, swimsuit that I was swimming in, it, it's all in there, right? But I can't put another trip's worth of clothes in there until we unpack. we got to get it all taken up. Uh, the clothing imagery that Paul uses, we don't start by putting on stuff, the stuff of Jesus over top of the old stuff. We have to take off. we got to put on. And so Jesus wants to transform your life. All right? That's the big takeaway today. He wants to bring his transformation. He wants to renovate your heart. He wants to help you unpack the suitcase of your soul. So the question for us then is how do we join him in the process? How do we say yes to the work that he wants to do in our lives? I mean, we're excited now. We're saying, okay, Jesus wants to make me just like him, but, but how do we start this process? Well, one of the things that we've recognized is that we can't uh, move beyond our story. Uh, we have to begin with our story because our story matters. Over the next number of weeks, we're going to give you a number of tools and resources to help you unpack things in your suitcase like anger and unforgiveness. We're going to talk about how to strengthen the foundation of your soul. Uh, but our story is really, really important. Rob Reamer, the author of Soul Care, says that we can never rise above the level of our self-awareness. What we don't know about ourselves is already killing us and keeping us stuck. And so over the next number of weeks, we want to invite God to bring that deep foundational transformation to each one of us as we unpack the suitcase, as we allow him to bring that renovation. Uh, and so what we want to do right now is, is rather than dive into a whole bunch of tools, what we want to do is we just want to share with you some of the ways that God has helped us get unstuck. Uh, Jen's going to share her story using the image of the suitcase. I'm going to share uh, my story through uh, the imagery of the home. And we just want to tell you a few different ways that God has helped to strengthen and renovate us. Uh, and so I'm going first, right? Sure, go nice. for Nice. <laughs> I just have a couple different notes here. We talked about this a few different ways. Um, oh, no, this is actually your story, right? Go 
Okay, cool. Yeah. So anyway, I grew up in a Christian home. I was raised by loving parents who uh, some of you met if you were here in church a few weeks ago. Uh, I've always been involved in the life of the church. And so if I were to use the imagery of the house to describe my Christian experience at a very early age, like four or five, uh, I recognized that I needed Jesus. I I knew that I had done bad things. I knew that Jesus could forgive me and bring me into a a relationship with God. And so I invited Jesus into my life. And the Bible says that when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and through the Spirit, Jesus comes to live in us. And so Jesus was living in my heart from a very young age. As I journeyed with Jesus through uh, grade school, through high school, uh, Jesus helped to do some deep cleaning. Uh, He helped me renovate rooms as I surrendered them to him. Uh, He helped me change bad habits and bad thinking around language and lust. Uh, But even after I'd gone to Bible college, even after I'd become a pastor, even after I was ordained as the Reverend Nathan Pollock, I generally don't give you my full title, but I am ordained uh, to the gospel ministry with the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. And so I am allowed to say that I am the Reverend Nathan Pollock. But again, that's not the way I normally talk about myself. But even with all of this, as the Reverend Nathan Pollock, There were cracks in my foundation. There were some significantly shaky places in my life that threatened to to bring down my house and my ministry. And so Jesus was doing this work, a work that I even, like I didn't even really know. I, I just, I had this shakiness, but I had no way of putting my finger on it. I had no idea where it was. And so in, uh, in January of 2016, I was at a conference called Set Free. Uh, the Set Free conference used some of the same spiritual practices that we'll be talking about on Sundays and in small groups. Uh, and while I was at this conference, Jesus showed me a time when I was in my early teens where I had actually built instability into the foundation of my soul. I had an experience with bullying where I was in conflict with some other kids at my church. And in the heat of the moment, in the intensity of the conflict, I made a vow that I would be a better Christian than those kids. If that's the way these Christian kids acted, I would be a better Christian than them. And so that was the way that I began to live my life. I kept score. Even though we didn't go to the same school, anytime their names or their family popped up in conversation, I would check myself and measure myself against them. Am I being better than that kid? Am I being better than that kid? As I began to keep score more and more in life, uh, the impact was extreme because as I kept score more and more and more, following Jesus wasn't first about relationship with Jesus. It was about being better than other people. And because I kept score with others, I started to think of everything in terms of measuring up. And so my imagery of myself as a follower of Jesus was not first as a follower of Jesus, not as a son of the Most High God. The way that I saw myself was a servant of Jesus who didn't want to fail, who could not fail. I must serve Jesus. Because I was keeping score, because I was deriving value from performance, I was afraid of failure. I wouldn't try anything unless I knew I could succeed. And so much of my inner dialogue and prayer to God was, God, help me not to fail. I don't want to fail. God, I'm doing this for you. But the thing is, when you're young in ministry and you are are fairly new in your marriage and you're a new father, uh, there's a lot of things that make you feel like a failure. And so my life was always shaking a bit. I mean, my foundations were always seeking to crumble under the weight of rejection or hardship. I was really one bad conversation away from having a part of my house actually collapse in on me. You know, what would happen if I experienced a deep rejection? What happened if I I experienced a a bad job performance review. Uh, So much of my life was shoring up this weak, shaky area. And I didn't even know it. Until that conference where Jesus helped me to see this vow that I'd made and all the lies that I was believing about my relationship with him, until Jesus helped me see it, I had no idea how much of my life was lived keeping score with other people. How am I doing? Am I doing better than so-and-so? Am I doing better than so-and-so? Now, when Jesus showed me this during the ministry time, uh, I, forgave, uh, I forgave those, I blessed those who persecuted me, uh, I broke the chains of the vows that I'd made, I invited Jesus to, to bring me his healing and his truth. 
And as I did that, a huge weight was lifted off of me, and I stepped into the identity that I was always meant to have. I am God's child and friend regardless of my performance. I don't work for God. I'm invited to work with God. I get to join my father in the family business, and I don't need to keep score. I don't need to be recognized or affirmed. I don't need to look with envy at other pastors or other churches. And even in failure, the cool thing is I'm a success because the issue of my value is settled at the cross. Friends, it it doesn't matter. If this church closes its door, that's not on me. But four years ago, that would have destroyed me because my whole identity was wrapped up in keeping score and being successful as defined by outward metrics. And I didn't even know. I didn't know how much of my life was driven by this one moment, how much I had built on this shaky part of my life. But when Jesus brought me that freedom, it was incredible. And uh, that moment, that foundational experience, it helped me to shore up uh, that part of my foundation as I anchored my life on the fact that I'm God's friend, chosen and beloved, apart from anything I have done or will do. Uh, The other cool thing about it is it it allowed me to actually receive from Jesus words of affirmation that I was his friend. Uh, When I go to my journal and when I listen to Jesus, so often what I hear him say to me is, Nathan, I love you. I called you by name. You're mine. I I wouldn't have even been able to receive that five years ago. It wouldn't have been part of my worldview, but now I can just rest in the fact that I'm God's kid and I love it. And Jesus helped me to get unstuck. And as he helped me to get unstuck, it brought me huge growth, huge obedience, huge peace. There's another area that I want to share where Jesus helped me to get unstuck. Another area where he showed me, uh, it was in the area of fear. Uh, In June of 2017, I was at another conference. This one was called Soul Care. Uh, And during that conference, again, focused on foundations, God helped free me from chronic fear and worry. Uh, As I look back on my life, I've always had a degree of fear and worry. I can remember uh, in grade one being so nervous and anxious that my stomach would get so upset I'd actually run to the bathroom and hide in the bathroom. Uh, This was all the way back in grade one. Like, what does a six-year-old kid have to be worried about? Uh, I don't really know, but as I look back on my life, I can just see that I always had this degree of fear and worry. And so that nervousness at school made me feel physically ill at times. I can remember being nervous about sports, about tests, about school, about church. There was always this low hum of anxiety. Um, And I don't think I ever really articulated it. I don't think I ever really knew what was going on. There was just this buzz through my system. Now, practically, this nervousness caused me to always feel a bit off balance. I would overthink and overanalyze everything. Uh, The nervousness caused me to second-guess the things that I felt God was calling me to do. And often the fear caused me to simply stop. I don't know what to do. I think I should be doing this. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should. I don't know. I'm just going to stop. And I just wouldn't really do anything. Now, during this time, um, as I felt unsure about things, uh, this was brought up at the Soul Care Conference, and during the conference, we talked about confession and repentance. We were given that tool. We talked about dealing with generational patterns, and worry is a big part of my family story generationally. Uh, but we also talked specifically about fear and how we can address it. And as part of that time, I actually shared my struggle with a group. We prayed specifically about the fear, and God delivered me from it. It was an incredible experience. The butterflies stopped. The buzzing went away. There was an inner peace that I was able to operate in for the first time. And it's crazy. I can't really describe it other than to say, for the first time in my life when I left that conference, there just wasn't the same nervousness anymore. I I could approach conversations no longer with a churn in my stomach. There's still sometimes with a churn in my head. It's like, do I really want to talk to this person right now? Yeah, I got to phone Jerry. All right, I'm going to phone Jerry. I'm just joking, Jerry. It's because you're sitting there. Um, You know, but it's it's not in my stomach anymore the way that it used to be. There's a peace. Now, I still have moments of fear. It's not something that I'm now immune to. Um, But I was rescued from a kind of fear and anxiety that I was never meant to carry. And I'm learning to walk in that new freedom on the truth that God promised he'll never leave me or forsake me. Uh, One of the other things that God says to me when I pause long enough to listen is he says, when you pass through the deep waters, those, those places of fear and uncertainty, I'll be with you. 
He promises me his presence, and so I, I grab a hold of that promise. I lean into that promise, and I'm learning to walk in the new freedom of the truth that, that God's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me. Now, again, up to that point, I didn't really know the depth of my problem. I didn't really know how big of an issue that fear was until Jesus, in the HGTV special, he picked up the sledgehammer, and he got to work. He had to expose some things in my life, and then he graciously helped clean up the mess. He strengthened and rehabbed those broken places. He did it for me. And as we go through this series, we believe that he can and wants to do that kind of work in your life as well. I realized I needed to unpack the suitcase of my soul about six years ago. Again, please listen to the timing of this. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Bible school. I actually was accredited as a children's pastor coming out of Bible school. We had been in ministry for eight, seven or eight years when God started showing us this. And so um, I think there is a caution and an encouragement in that timing. Um, the caution would be just because you've been a Christian your whole life does not mean you have this figured out and there's not things that God doesn't work on in your heart. The encouragement would be it's never too late. <laughs> like you have never gone too far too long. Um, there's never too much that God can't show you and work in your heart and help you unpack your suitcase or rebuild your foundation or whichever one of those you grabbed onto. So about six years ago, uh, God started to show me what needed to happen in my life. I grew up in a Christian home, great parents who prayed for me, showed me Jesus, they brought me to church, they showed me what living in community looks, uh, looked like. But as life happened, I gathered hurts and wounds, and I didn't know how to process them. Six years ago at prayer retreat, there was a man named Martin Sanders there, and he was talking about secrets and how secrets destroy us. We cannot live and thrive when we are carrying secrets in our hearts. And the thing is, I had this secret that I had not told a single soul. And the secret was, when I was a little girl, I was abused by my best friend. Um, and I was ashamed of it. I was like mortified. I thought if people found out, I don't know what I thought, but I did not want people to find out that I had been abused in that way. Uh, and so it was a secret, but the Holy Spirit was stirring in my heart as Martin was talking about sharing secrets, and I knew that I needed to share. So that night, I, like Nathan and I sat, and I shared everything I'd been holding in for 30 years. Well, 25 years, I guess, because Anyways, <laughs> and um, this, there was this release when I shared my secret. And just like the love and graciousness that Nathan received me with was really helpful also. But the process of just sharing, God started to unpack things in my soul. A couple months later, I, uh, I was at a Holy Spirit encounter. Um, and at this Holy Spirit encounter, it was really, it, it was a weekend conference teaching us how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, how to encounter him, how to know that he um, is with us and is for us. And um, I, the Holy Spirit showed me that weekend that I had been living my entire life under this banner that read rejected. And so every decision I made, every encounter I had, every conversation I went into, do, like whatever it was, I went in saying, not only am I already rejected, but they're going to reject me. And, and again, like Nathan talked about, I didn't know this was what I was living my whole life as. I had no idea until the Holy Spirit started to show me, until I started to ask him. Um, at that weekend... The Lord changed my banner from rejected to child of God, chosen and beloved. At that conference, I realized Jesus wasn't joking in John when he talked about how the sheep will hear their shepherd's voice. I thought I was like one of the ones who couldn't. I would never be able to hear God's voice. And he showed me that I can. 
I look back over my life and I see all the times I was rejected. Even as a young girl, no, I, where I thought I would be rejected, even as a young girl, our children's pastor asked if anybody had accepted Christ that week because she had some cool tracts she wanted to give us. And I knew I had it, I was in the church, but I hadn't accepted Christ. So I put my hand up and I lied and I said that I had so that I always thought it was so I could get the tract, but I think it was deep down because I just didn't want to be rejected. I wanted to be part of something. Um, in high school, I had a new group of friends every year from grade 8 to grade 12. There was always some reason why my group of friends would switch over. And I just started internalizing it as me. I'm the problem. I'm the rejected one. Um, coming out of Bible school, we actually went to Vaughan, Ontario to get a job as I was offered a job as a children's pastor. And so we went to do the like candidating weekend. Like it seemed like a pretty solid thing. And at the end of that, the elders board prayed about it and they just said, we don't feel like God is calling you here. That's not what I had heard because I wasn't listening to God's voice. I was listening to what I wanted to do. And so again, it was just I missed that God actually was directing my path. Instead, all I saw was that I was rejected yet again. And so I'm so thankful that God changed my banner from rejected to chosen and beloved. Because that's the truth. God chose me from before the foundations of the earth. I am his beloved. But I had to let him speak it to me. So from there, I started a journey of caring for my soul I learned how to forgive. I learned how to listen to God t as he showed me lies in my life. I learned how to step in to my identity. I want to tell you, this is still a journey. <laughs> this is still, these roots went down deep, friends. And so let me give you an example. This morning, I woke up and I knew exactly what I wanted to wear. I was very excited about this outfit except then these doubts started to come into my head. What if they don't listen to me because my jeans are ripped? So I changed my outfit, and then I was like, wait a minute, that's not my problem. Like, but it was this fear of rejection. The truth is, even if you don't listen to a word that I'm saying, my God has me, my God loves me. My God is holding me, and I am being obedient and faithful to him in sharing my story. And that's what matters. That's the truth. Because the truth I used to say to myself is, oh, no, they won't reject me for wearing ripped jeans. But you might. You actually might. That's the reality of it. And so the truth is God has chosen me. Um, it's, I mean, it seems like a silly little example, but those silly little examples add up to really big things that impact our souls. So, like I said, there are days and seasons where I step back into rejected. Sometimes it's easier to hide behind the tasks I need to do than to risk out and be, than to step out and risk and to be rejected. But the Lord keeps calling me back to him, back to my identity, which allows me to live more openly in community. I'm a work in progress, and I always will be. But the thing is, since I started the journey to unpacking the suitcase of my soul, I can actually see progress. Whereas before I'd say I'm a work in progress, but guys, there was no progress. Mm -hmm. And now there is, and I just, I want you to know that that is for you too. No matter where you are, if you've seen progress your whole life, that is amazing and I rejoice with you, but I want you to know there's even more. Mm -hmm. If you feel stuck, there is hope in Jesus because he promises that he will walk with you and he will journey with you and you are not stuck anymore because of Jesus. So we are inviting you to say yes with us. <laughs> We're inviting you on this journey to greater victory and greater freedom, to more of God in your life. It's going to be possible that in the next little bit, you'll come up with a million reasons why not to journey with us in this next little bit. And so I want to challenge you to look for all of the reasons why you should join us on this journey. 
Jesus is calling you to say yes to him, to say yes to more of him. And Nathan and I have experienced so much healing and freedom, and we know God has more healing and freedom for us. And we want that for you guys too. There is always, always, always more. And I know, I know it, I know you're feeling the call. I know you know that there is more, no matter where you at. And so I'm just, I'm asking you to, to look at that and be honest and just follow the call of God to more. We invite you to really dig in over the next several weeks as we explore this journey. But it is a yes that only you can say. This fall has been kind of a funny fall. It sort of has felt a little bit like we have been behind the eight ball because we're already at October 10th. We're already at Thanksgiving. Uh, and we're only just now beginning to talk with you about the next step, the small group, all that sort of stuff with the launch. Uh, but part of what we're going to do like on Sundays... Uh, Sundays are going to be, we're going to talk about these things, we're going to give you tools to put in your tool belt, uh, like confession, uh, how, to, uh, how to recognize lies and then stand in the truth. We're going to give you all the tools, uh, but to go deeper, we're going to invite you to come to uh, a midweek small group. Uh, there's going to be one on Mondays at 7, starting not this, like not tomorrow, but eight days from now. Uh, there's going to be a Monday group and a Wednesday group. They're going to be doing the exact same thing. Uh, it's going to be here at the church online, people. Uh, you can email me, Nathan at centerpointchurch.ca. Uh, we're going to make the Monday one a hybrid group. Uh, and basically what we want to do is we want to journey for probably about eight to ten weeks. And the, the, the Monday night and the Wednesday night small group will be kind of paralleling this. We'll be using the soul care curriculum. And we're just going to give you uh, another person teaching similar content about these foundations, about unpacking the suitcase. Uh, and we're going to give you an opportunity to step into an experience of, of what does it look like to forgive? What does it look like to uh, deal with fear? What does it look like to uh, you know, unpack some of these, these generational experiences? Uh, it could get messy. Uh, the cool thing is, is that we, uh, we know Christian counselors, we know people to help you in all different walks. And then the other thing that I would just highlight again uh, is that one of the ways that God is described in scriptures, that he is the great physician. He is the Lord who heals us. Uh, and there's a lot of times in our journey where Jesus doesn't actually, uh, either he doesn't go after the thing we think that we need, uh, he'll point us to another place, or that he treats us far more gently uh, than we would imagine. And so we may come into uh, a conversation or to an experience like this thinking, oh man, what if God starts to touch that place of deep pain? Uh, what if God asks me to share that secret? What will happen if? And the cool thing about God is that he's so patient, he's so gentle, uh, even when he leads us into something that seems far bigger than we can uh, understand. I mean, what did we read from Isaiah 40? Uh, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Uh, he is the one who simply speaks and stars, uh, you know, leap into existence. So he has the capacity to bring healing to us. Uh, but we just want to let you know that, that part of what needs to happen as a congregation, part of what needs to happen in our life, is we need to invite the Spirit to bring some strength to these areas of our life. We want to be a church on mission. We want to be a church that is Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, and mission-focused. Uh, we want Jesus to uh, enable us and empower us to begin to reach out into our neighborhood in greater and greater and greater ways. Uh, but our obedience and our power, uh, so often that is impacted and that limit is limited by our identity wounds, by those shaky places in our life. Uh, Nathan, while he is wrestling with fear and fear of failure, he's not going to bang on any doors and offer to pray for people because that's scary and because what if they say no? Whoa, failure. I mean, that is just going to destroy me. And so rather than that, I'm just going to not do anything. And so a lot of what we want to do, a lot of what we think Jesus wants to begin to do in us as a congregation in 2022, uh, we're going to need to have our suitcases unpacked a little bit. We're going to need to have our foundations shored up a little bit uh, in order for us to be able to do the kinds of things that Jesus is calling us to do. Uh, and so we're inviting you into that journey. Uh, so again, it's not this week. 
So we have one more Sunday to talk about it. It'll be on the 18th and the 20th, those small groups. If you let me know you're coming, that'll be fantastic so I can figure out uh, where we're going to have stuff. Um, the other thing that we would invite you to do, in addition to showing up Sundays and tracking with the small groups on either Monday or Wednesday, the other thing that we really need to call you into this is, is to prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, this journey really begins by saying, Jesus, I have no idea what's going on in my heart, what's going on in my mind. I have no idea the work that you want to do, but I'm inviting you, Jesus, to have your way. Uh, come and fill my life, and, and I'm afraid, but God, would you point out those things in me that you want to change? Uh, would you pick up that sledgehammer, even though the sledgehammer seems very, very scary, but would you do the work that only you can do? Mm-hmm. Um, so let's pray, and then uh, we have two songs that we're going to respond with. So, Lord Jesus, we... I I thank you for the work that you've done in my life. I thank you for the fact that as I stand here today, I can look back on that conference in 2016 and that conference in 2017. I can see significant work that you've done in my life, but more than that, God, I can see what would happen if I had not been brought to that place. Uh, I would not have survived 2017 unless you'd brought the healing work that you did in 2016. I just know it. I can see it. God, you are in the business of bringing transformation. You're in the business of making us look more and more and more like Jesus, and we are excited about that. We're also a little bit nervous about that because we've been listening to a lot of other voices. Uh, We've been moving a lot of other directions, and so we recognize that, but we pray, Jesus, that you would bring us to a new place of confidence in your goodness. We pray that as we run to you, that you would begin this week even to point out Uh, some of those places and spaces where you want to bring uh, freedom into our lives. And we just commit this fall to you. Uh, This is something that you've been calling us to do for a number of months. We finally feel organized enough to launch it. Uh, But Jesus, we need you by your spirit to move in power. Uh, So lead us and guide us and direct us as we run to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.